Welcome back to Left Anchor. I'm Ryan Cooper. And I'm Alexi the Greek. And we're very pleased to have Professor and Political Philosopher Mina Krishnamurthy here today uh, to talk about Martin Luther King Jr., political theory, political motivation, political emotion, a lot of timely things. And really, I'm super excited because this is exactly what Left Anchor is supposed to be about. We, we want to have brilliant scholars whose ideas and philosophy and theory are useful, who, who actually inform our understanding of citizenship and, and how to how to do politics, uh, to how to seek justice. So, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with both of you. Super exciting to hear that you have a book in the works, uh, The Emotion. I don't know if the title will stay, right? But this is a great title. The Emotions of Nonviolence, Revisiting Martin Luther King Jr.'s Letter from Birmingham Jail. Is that the plan? It's a good title. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Sticking with that title so far, it's like, you know, I've got like six out of eight chapters done. So it's like well on its way. Yeah. Wonderful. Ryan knows how you, how you feel. He's, he's in the midst of uh, finishing up a book he's writing at the moment as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's due in two weeks, and I still have three chapters to write. Whoa, that's intense. <laughs> okay. So the the book is going to be very bad. <laughs> Deadlines are helpful. Deadlines are helpful. Deadlines are helpful. I agree with that. <laughs> and, and you know, it's it's my understanding that this book is largely about discovering in the in the writings, rhetoric, speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, political theory, political philosophy that has been kind of underappreciated and that could, beyond his rhetoric, could help us understand uh, what it means to seek justice as citizens and specifically how to understand how our effective states um, are key and, and important to our political agency. So uh, the article that we read, um, Parenthetical White Tyranny and the Democratic Value of Distrust, seems like a good place to start because it, it, it seems um, very much to dive into the questions of how do the people seek to overcome oppression and how do they get activated and motivated uh, and what role does their effective state and, and, and the tactics to change that state play into both their understanding of what's possible and whether they should or shouldn't uh, act. Is that, is that a, a good intro? Yeah, I think that's a great intro. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, the project is about, like you said, affective states and thinking about their role in political resistance. So I think we, I mean, we're always, all of us who are in, interested in the movement or in the movement or studying the movement are interested in thinking about what gives rise to it. And I think that King actually has like a really interesting sort of guidebook in terms of how to start a movement that's kind of in his writings. And especially in the early writings, he was really interested in psychology, like read a lot of Freud, little, read a lot of other social psych um, theories. And if you kind of look at his work, that theme, even though he doesn't always refer to them later on, it sort of is a theme that goes throughout the work. Um, and I think it's something that's under explored, but also I think really important this moment as we're trying to think about bringing more people into the movement. Absolutely. Yeah, very intentional and thoughtful, um, the, the ideas that went into the strategies that came about, right, and, and the movement and why it was successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk about, first of all, I also want to say that I really like in your, your paper on distrust, how you point out that in conceptual ethics, your your particular conception of, of political distrust here is um, your motivation, in a sense, is what's useful, right? You're not claiming it's, it's the only definition, the best definition, but, but this is one that could be useful for um, understanding political action and understanding, um, you know, explanatory power as well. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, what you mean by this narrow conception of normative distrust uh, as against what people might just assume you mean by the word. Right. That's a good, I mean, that's a good point. I think one thing is that I'm always trying to be very pluralistic in my approach to philosophy. I don't think I have like the best or the right, all things considered answer all the time. So this is really just like an attempt to think about what King was sort of telling us or what we can derive from King's work about the idea of distrust. Um, and I think my main thought was that if we look at this understanding this way that he's understood distrust, we actually get an interesting account of the role that distrust might have played in the movement. And I think that's something we often see distrust talked about, particularly maybe on, 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 in sort of the side of conservative politics. And I think sometimes it gets kind of, um, I don't want to say co-opted, but it's a theme that kind right. of comes up on that side. But I actually think there's a different kind of like a healthy distrust of political institutions that can be really important um, in terms of playing a role in the movement. And so the paper tries to give this account that's taken from King, and it, it suggests that um, distrust, at least partially, is a kind of cognitive attitude or a belief that an individual or a set of institutions is unlikely to do what justice requires on its own. 
Um, right. Yeah, I, I like that element that that um, it wasn't just lack of trust. It, it was a certain uh, epistemic confidence in knowing what people wouldn't actually do that you needed them to do if something uh, if oppression was going to be overcome. And, and that then related to the need for you to act and to have political agency, um, it, because it, I could think of the easy contrast with, say, Trump supporters or libertarians who just say the government will never do anything for you. Don't trust the government. You know, the, the famous Reagan quote, you know, that the scariest thing is I'm from the government and I'm here to help or something, right? Right. Um, so, so, uh, so, yeah, I, th I think this is a, a, useful, a useful distinction. Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I had a, you know, um, immediately sprung to mind like the sort of attitude that, um, you know, you often see with respect to like the democratic party, uh, nowadays, you know, the, like you look at their track record and you think these, these people never do the right thing. Um, and King, uh, basically had this, the same view, uh, about the kind of like white moderate establishment in the South and in the North that, you know, maybe they would say the right things, maybe they wouldn't, but like at the end of the day, you just couldn't trust them. Um, but I think the interesting thing, you know, about now uh, is that, you know, he didn't just end it there and say, like, well, you know, the the, the white moderates are, are are hopeless and we're doomed and, you know, you like shouldn't vote or whatever. Instead, he thought about how we could force them to act by his, you know, um, nonviolent uh, protests and so on. And he was, you know, in, in his context, very successful at that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the point that you just made about force or what he sometimes refers to as nonviolent coercion or nonviolent pressure is kind of an element of King's uh, theory that I think is often overlooked. Like, I really do think that he saw economic boycotts, uh, marches and protests as a way of coercing those who would otherwise be unlikely to act into acting. And so it's kind of key that there is this kind of pressure, right? And I think it isn't just like all love and like touchy feely faith and hope. I mean, there was, there was actually this idea of force and the power of the movement and what it could do. Right. And, and it was combined with a distinction between the white moderate and say the KKK, which, which you note in your paper, which is very important because the, the, there are those who will never do what you want, no matter how, unless you, you fight the civil war. Right. And, and then there are those who won't do it unless they're forced or coerced by the pressure applied to them. And I think that actually maps on to, to the Democrats and the Republicans today quite well, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I think he thinks it's sort of like a waste of time to focus on the KKK. And we could think today, to some extent, there's a certain group of Trump supporters that it's not really, they're not among the persuadable or the forcible. They're the most likely to engage in a kind of backlash phenomenon. Um, so in a way, it's like a waste of resources to think about those people. We should be thinking about the small group of white liberals that's actually the group that you can move to the left. Yeah. And um, I also, you know, was reminded of uh, the late, the late great David Broder, you know, the dean of Washington centrism. And he had an attitude about distrust that it was, uh, uh, you know, he pointed to the sort of like, how distrust would kind of undermine the political order that, um, you know, I mean, he's right in a sense to say that like, if, if nobody trusts the government, you know, to do the right thing and, and everyone thinks that it's just all completely corrupt, then it will become very difficult. You know, you, you could have a lot of instability and so on, but his response to that was just to sort of urge people not to be distrustful. And not to really, you know, it's like he, he had a like aristocratic view of how the, you know, the how politics should work. The, like Washington, D.C. was the town of the like, you know, permanent bipartisan establishment. And the job of the citizenry is to just bless whatever they did, no matter how horrible it was. And I think, you know, if you're worried, as you say, about, you know, rampant distrust, at least among the people who have not driven themselves completely looney tunes by you know, uh, Breitbart and, and Gateway Pundit, um, you know, you ought to consider the fact that the record of the establishment over the last, you know, say 20 years is is pretty horrible. And there are a lot of failures that, you know, uh, not only were not really reckoned with, no one was uh, really ever punished for that. And the same people are, are still running everything, like Joe Biden, 
who, you know, was implicated in all of the mass incarceration and police brutality stuff that we're currently being protested against now. And so, you know, it seems to me like if you're this sort of like anxious centrist who's worried about the, you know, the masses uh, uh, get, uh, going crazy and like doing a revolution or something, well, the thing to do is not commit so many horrible mistakes. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so how do we separate, you know, if we want to use the the value we see in cultivating this certain kind of distress in the in the citizenry to fight for justice, how do we um how do we avoid or how how do we kind of differentiate that from kind of the general distrust that uh as like our, our friend Dave Kybe notes that you know there's a lot of slack in, in the in the country. A lot of people are just not political, they don't even vote, that you know, most people just don't pay attention. Um and a lot of that might be because they don't think that any politician will do anything for them. So, so that seems to be a certain kind of distrust that doesn't motivate at all. Um, is, there, is there a way to understand why sometimes distrust motivates and sometimes it does not? Yeah. So I think, in a sense, the argument that I presented in the first piece is kind of incomplete, which is why the book's happening and why some other papers are happening. Because I think, in a way, the thing that I've been arguing now is that distrust has to be complemented by a certain kind of faith. Um, you might call it a faith in humanity um, or a democratic faith uh, in the people um, and their abilities and their power. And particularly, I think, you know, I've been arguing that King himself really has faith in the abilities of black people, uh, you know, the racially oppressed to to put pressure on those who can be pressured in the right direction. And I think if you didn't believe in that and the faith in the people and in sort of racialized minorities in particular, then you wouldn't have any hope that things could be different. So I do think that that's kind of a key component. And I think the other thing for King is that he also believes in the value of non-electoral politics. Like voting isn't the be-all, end-all of democracy. And I, one of the things in the paper on white tyranny that I kind of suggest is that actually, you know, protest is a really important piece and part of the package of the democratic rights that citizens have, in part because it can act as an additional check. So when voting is going wrong, when you can't have your voice heard through regular voting processes, what do you do? Well, you turn to the streets. Um, so I think that's an important part too. Biden, I mean, because there is this debate about whether people should vote for Biden or not. And one view is like, obviously, Biden is better than Trump. And another is also just like electoral politics isn't the be all end all of democracy. And there's a lot of work to be done at the grassroots level. Um, right. Yeah, yeah I, like I would definitely co-sign that, you know, wh whether or not Biden uh, takes power, you know, probably would make some difference on the margin in terms of like handling this pandemic and so on. But I think it's a lot more important for people who are worried about you know, the country falling to pieces to continue to mobilize and to, you know, be in the streets uh, if he does take power. Um, because, you know, uh, uh, voting is it's simple and, and easy, you know, practically pointless and literally pointless in most states because they're they're not uh, competitive partisan wise. And so, uh, you know, you're you going out to, you know, do some kind of organization or union drive or protest uh, for, you know, Black Lives Matter and so on is probably a million times more effective than voting. Um, you know, not, you know, again, not to say that voting is always pointless, but that, you know, like the whole thing is, is it matters. And especially in terms of individuals, um, it, it matters a lot more to that kind of direct action stuff, I think. And maybe to the extent that electoral politics matters, it can help us put in those white. I mean, if Biden's not the white moderate, uh, nobody is, right? Like, so like it doesn't give us a victory, but at least gives us the opportunity to pressure in a way that a Trump wouldn't, you know, at, at that level, right? And that's the, you know, one of the benefits of federalism is that there are lots of opportunities to pressure somebody, you know. Um, but I think to your point, and, and in the paper, you talk about King, um, involving children, but not just for what it would do to Bull Connor, but because of kind of the affective and epistemological subject formation of the children. It, it, it actually, I think, gives people hope to be in the streets. Like it forms that faith that you have because you have the solidarity, perhaps because you have that feeling like you're doing something, maybe. I don't know. What, what, what are your thoughts on, on how that works? Yeah, that's a great question. I've been thinking a bit about it, partly because I was rereading Why We Can't Wait. And what's fascinating in that book, because it sort of begins, the introduction begins sort of looking at the movement through the eyes of a little a little black boy and a little black girl, and it kind of ends with the discussion of children. And it is, I think you're right, it's about thinking about the future. But I also think, 
because I think King is a kind of virtue ethicist, a lot of it is about cultivating, habituating a sense of justice. And the earlier you start, the better, because it's really hard to be a just person. And so taking kids out on the street, especially again, if, if he has, if he believes that the racially oppressed are kind of going to be the kind of root of democratic change, then we better start inculcating these habits in racialized minorities early. Um, and, and so I think for him, it's about cultivating that ethos and those habits. So it's a kind of education. But I think you're right also, even hope is something that's something that I think in a way has to be cultivated in faith and being part of the movement as a way to do that. Right. It reminds me so, I mean, so many of the Obama kind of slogans are applicable. Uh, you know, the fierce urgency of now that he appropriated from Dr. King and if we are the ones we've been waiting for. But what he didn't say is also, I'm the opposition. You need to push me. <laughs> and then Black right. Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, of course, though, did, did just that. They didn't trust Obama and his administration. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and in a way, too, I think the thought, too, is in pushing Obama in particular is there was a kind of faith that maybe at least a small amount of faith that maybe he would actually listen. Right. This, if there was anybody to appeal to and to push, maybe this is the person. So I don't think it's an accident that, you know, BLM really starts during during that time. It seems like it makes complete sense. And then in some sense, it dies down a little right at the beginning of the Trump administration. And then we see the women's movement, uh, you know, really start to, to take off at that point. Right. Yeah. Um that this maybe raises a question, you know, about, uh, you know, Martin Luther King was, is, I guess, you know, as, as close as you get in America to a sort of secular saint, I guess. And, um, you know, his kind of popularized image is all about, you know, uh, uh, being against discrimination as such. And, um, you know, over the past, uh, you know, they, they, they call it the great awakening kind of white liberals have moved dramatically to the left on questions of, of racial injustice specifically. In fact, on some questions, they are to the left of African Americans. Um, and that, you know, that's a very, that's a pretty encouraging development on its own terms, but it also, you know, ra like raises the question of the rest of kind of Dr. King's uh, like political program, and especially towards the end of his life, he was uh, about sort of trying to tie in his racial justice thing with a, an economic justice, trying to create a poor people's movement of, uh, you know, that, that would um, include all of the, you know, downtrodden, uh, broke people of the country, white, black, Latino, or otherwise. And that ran into much more stiff resistance than his uh, civil rights stuff. And um, I think, you know, in, in, in the popular mythologies, it been largely sort of like stripped out of his kind of history. And so, you know, I wonder what you think in terms of people sort of coming to grasp that element of his thinking and, and building that into like their sort of, you know, identity, uh, um, you know, and their, their personal morality about what needs to be done to address racial injustice, which I would say, you know, of necessity must include some, some, you know, economic components. Yeah, absolutely. And I think actually it's really interesting if you read through the King canon, which is a gigantic opus, the economic plan was there from the beginning. Like he really does talk about, um, yeah. Uh, wage gaps right from the beginning, access to jobs in general. Obviously, everyone knows about his appeal for fair housing, but that's where he sees a lot of opposition, right? When he moves to Chicago and it has this movement that, in fact, he says later, right, that that's actually the most fierce opposition that he faced was from the white moderates in the North. Um, so I think, you know, by that time becomes really disillusioned, uh, especially around economic rights. So his freedom plan, which, you know, was he basically wanted to ensure a kind of uh, like a Marshall plan, right? In some sense, a domestic Marshall plan with a basic income for, for, um, for Americans was part of the plan, but I think the economic agenda was always there. And I think you're right that it's something that's been lost, but I do think it's something we're seeing being recovered now. A lot of people who are working on King are thinking about the economic elements of his project. And I think that's why, you know, it's amazing to read uh, in terms of rereading his work and some of the arguments he gives for things like basic income really was thinking about like automation as one of, you know, one of the main reasons, right? And, and, and now as we're seeing with COVID, so many people who don't have access Access to jobs. It's a new kind of reason to say, well, what's going to lead people to unemployment? Why wouldn't we have a basic income that will supplement, you know, whatever other income they might be making? It seems like those questions are just as live as they were then in a, in a different, in a different way. 
Yeah, Andrew Yang, eat your heart out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Of course, you know, the point though for him is that it wouldn't just be a basic income, right? right. It'd be lots of other things. Um, so I think it's important when we talk about basic, at least for me, when I talk about basic income, it's one component of a broader program that would involve many other other things. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, yeah. I think people don't appreciate how uh, integral and synthetic a thinker King was and, and how he diagnosed the, the problems as interconnected, you know, race, racism, imperialism, um, and, you know, uh, capitalism, frankly. And he's, he's a student of Marx, right? And had a lot to, lot to offer. Um, yeah, there's well, a great you, speech yeah. that I think people don't always pay attention to at the end of the Selma marches where he really talks about the link between capitalism and racism and talks about racial inferiority, much in the way we might now talk about when we talk about racial capitalism, to say that there had to be a group that was racialized so that their labor could be exploited. Uh, so, uh, you know, the capitalist system could exist. He says that, you know, right at the end of the Selma march. So that part of him has been sort of erased, but I think it's a really important part of his understanding of, of sort of diagnosing what's wrong with, with the United States. States. Yeah, he even, um, I, as I recall, he spoke specifically, I think we've mentioned it on the podcast before, about how the racial caste system ends up victimizing even poor white people specifically. Yes. yes. He talks about how, um, you know, the, the his jailers, uh, when, when he was in jail, uh, you know, he, they told him how much they were making. And he said, you, you, you ought to be out here marching with us. That's right. <laughs> it, That's right. That that if I remember the the you you have been put in the position of supporting your oppressor because through prejudice and blindness you fail to see that the same forces that oppress Negroes in American society oppress poor white people. Yes, and that you know it's like, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Here we are. And then he kind of gives a, like a Du Boisian story, though, too, about why that's the case. Like you basically trade soldier soul so you could get the wage of whiteness, um, thinking you're a bigger person because he says of the color of your skin. So he also adds this like Du Boisian kind of explanation of the right. psychological mechanism. Because why would you do that? It's not in your self-interest, economically speaking. You're being exploited. Your labor's being exploited. Why would you sell out like this? Well, oh, you're getting this psychological wage. So I think it's like an interesting, you know, bringing Du Bois back into this discussion about racial capitalism at that time when people really weren't doing that, actually. That's wonderful. I, it just seems so obvious that Black Lives Matter is a, is a perfect kind of continuation of that project. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand, I, I mean, obviously, from whether it's cynical or just ignorant, the responses of All Lives Matter, how, how the, the particular focus on how black lives are disregarded and harmed and killed is actually a universal claim to the, the equality of all and the need for all to overcome the oppression of capitalism, racial capitalism. Um, so, so I, I wonder, it's, it's a tricky thing, right? Because we're, we're dealing with trust, distrust, vertical and horizontal, as you say, we're, we're trying to, to bring political solidarity and intersectionality while also having a binary of a oppressed and oppressor. So, so how, how do, how does, how do we know, matter, uh, navigate kind of the sophistication and nuance of, of that problem, um, th through something that, that feels at least in terms of activism, like a very clear, it's us against them, right? It's, it's it seems, it seems like political education is, is tricky here. How, how do we do that through, through this kind of uh, activism and, and theorizing? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think King, I actually have been thinking a lot about this, that at the heart of this project is really a theory of moral learning. And so I think he's very pluralistic. Like, I think he thinks in terms of, you know, the kind, and this is where the affective elements really come in for me, because I think he thinks that emotions can be, appealing to emotions can be a way of educating people. So I think sometimes, like in the letter from Birmingham Jail, he's appealing to a sense of shame that he thinks that white moderates should feel for failing to live up to their commitments. Um, and at least I argue in some of my work that that kind of shame can be morally transformative and help undo the ideologies, whether it's a capitalistic one or one of white supremacy or both mixed together, um, can undo those ideologies and help us see things and you said undo the kind of blindness you know that might be at play right. and so but in other cases i think he thinks that straight up empathy will work i think he gets you know he's always yeah. you know that's maybe going to appeal to a small group of people then there's yeah. always the force that you economic pressure so he's got yeah. all these things happening so, right it strikes me it's so aristotelian in, in terms of not just cultivating your 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 virtues your excellences but your prudential wisdom and, and understanding 
specifically how emotions in you and in others are going to operate to form you to do the right thing, to do justice and to know justice and to feel what it feels like to be just, right? Or to feel what it feels like to be oppressed. Um, so that's a very, that's a very cool thing to think about how political activism is, is, um, kind of the space wherein we can teach each other through action, um, how to feel properly about what's being done and not done. And I think people forget too that for, for Aristotle, um, Injustice, right, is also allowing yourself to be oppressed. It's the mean between doing oppression and letting yourself be oppressed. So it's it's a cool thing to connect that to, to King and today, I think. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because I think, well, I think there are a lot of lively debates right now um, about whether the oppressed have duties to kind of resist their own oppression. And I think there's some generational differences. I don't know. I've been hearing a lot of different views about this as I talk to my students. But I think one thing that comes from Gandhi and King and many others from that time uh, is really that the, the, nobody else is going to be able to do it. So again, like it's, you had both sort of already said, like, if we don't do it ourselves, who's going to do it? So I think it's right, really key right. to the project that we think about. And that's why I think in many ways, a lot of, we've often thought of King in terms of what he was saying to the white moderates, which is definitely part of the project. But when he's thinking about who's really at the basis of the movement, he's thinking about the oppressed, whether it's racially oppressed or economically oppressed, um, and thinking about how to motivate those people and educate them, as you said, through emotions and the movement and kind of help people habituate the right versions of those emotions so they do what's just and right. Yeah, it takes some amazing training and discipline to let the water hoses hit you and not punch somebody. <laughs> like, right. like we, we forget about the, the cultivation of, of, of that, that kind of, I mean, it's called militant for a reason because it takes discipline and training and, you know, uh, so much to learn. Now, what, what other um, political emotions or, or elements you mentioned faith have you been digging into in the book uh, that extend beyond uh, distrust? Yeah. So I think one of the parts of the package or the book is really to also d rediscover these darker elements in King, because I do think everyone knows that King talks about love and faith and hope. I think that's our standard interpretation. So there's some, you know, there's some bits about despair and disappointment, but also fear is one of the things I'm writing about. King really thinks that fear and then fearlessness are kind of key. So there's a legitimate fear that black Americans have that if they go and take to the streets, that there's going to be reprisal, whether it's being lynched, uh, you know, in the middle of the night or being fired from your job in the morning. And so that's a legitimate warranted fear. But he believes at the same time that that kind of warning system is evolutionarily useful and it's self-protective. Um, but it can also, he thinks, be turned into something innovative. So he says that a fear, like we create all these really we're scared fear of the dark he says is what le leads to the creation of electricity so we don't have to stay in the dark anymore so if we channel fear into the right direction he thinks it can be creative and constructive and part of being courageous or fearlessness is still being scared right but standing up to that fear and so part of the question is well, how do we motivate that kind of courage among the oppressed to stand up against what you know stand for what they believe in but stand up against what they're scared of and so i think it's a really interesting diagnosis like that he is thinking about fear because it's something he definitely felt when his house is being bombed. He's getting death threats. Uh, that leads him to, into a bit of a tailspin of despair at moments where he thinks about leaving the, mo the movement. And then, you know, something pulls him out of it, which is his faith in black people. Um, some of the elderly women who are walking down the streets along with him, as well as obviously his religious faith, um, faith in God. Um, <clears throat> I have a, maybe a bit of a related question, I suppose. Um, the thing, the thing that stands out uh, about Martin Luther King today is that you know he was such a central figure. Um, you know, he was he was this like kind of face of the movement, uh, for lack of a better word. I mean, there are a lot of other people involved, of course, but um, that's one thing that really s seems like a big difference with the movement today. The the black Black Lives Matter thing is pretty amorphous and doesn't have a whole lot of structure to it. And there have been, you know, some people who kind of, you know, have, have like come out of it, but then, you know, some of them turn out to just be like grifters, you know, trying to build their personal brand and so on. And, you know, what, what do you suppose was the role of King in terms of a leader and, and whether or not that, you know, someone like that would be useful or necessary in, in terms of like catalyzing, you know, mass, mass uh, movements today, you know, to keep, keep going beyond where they have, you know, admittedly c considerable accomplishments so far. Um, but, you know, to keep that uh, pressure going. Yeah. So I have 
been thinking a lot about this because I think in many ways it's good to, in terms of branding, everything we know now about branding, like having a brand and King was definitely a brand that people could identify with, uh, challenge stereotypes, met all the mandates of respectability politics in a lot of ways of the time. So he, and I can see of that playing a role, but one thing that King himself says is that in the movement, one of the things we're trying to do is create the kind of relationships that we want to see in our future utopia, in our democracy. And I think one of the things that we're getting from BLM, which is a movement originally, you know, that comes from black queer women, um, and we think about the as an outgrowth, I think of it in a way as an outgrowth of Occupy, is you get a sort of movement that doesn't want a hierarchy. And part of what, you know, these movements are trying to create is a society of equals where there isn't some one leader or one representative. So I think uh, morally that ideal makes a lot of sense that we want a sense of equality to characterize the movement at every level. But I think the part of me that's really into the social sciences and and thinks a lot about motivation, I can see the power of having like a brand name, um, a leader, but maybe BLM, Black Lives Matter as a slogan does a lot of what, you know, maybe that is the brand name and that is the thing that people kind of associate with. Maybe we're thinking about new ways in the face of social media to kind of have a face for the movement that's faceless in a way, right? Um, and of course, right. we galvanize around Flo George Floyd. Um, and so other you know, people who aren't leaders become kind of the faces of the movement. And maybe that's a good thing because it draws our attention back to the people rather than some figurehead. So I think there's a lot of intelligence behind these decisions that are being made. I know that I've been in rooms with conversations with organizers about these. I know these questions and I know that many people across the country are talking about these things. Um, and so I think the choices they're making to me are very experimental. I think we're in a different wave of the civil rights. We think of the civil rights movement is a long arc. We're in a different wave. Um, and I think it's really important to the movement that we at least try out and see what it's like to not have a leader and see how much can be done. Yeah. I also, you know, it's interesting. Uh, w one conscious reason that I've heard makes a lot of sense too, specifically with the history of, of black radicals is that black leaders get assassinated. Right. And, and, and if you don't know what home they're in, you can't kill Fred Hampton. If you don't know who the leader is, you can't chop off the head. Right. And so there's something about to talk about the dark part of the human soul, um, something about that, that, that maybe also goes with empowering who, whoever is in your local area to, 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 to feel like you're the leader there, you know, you take, take some responsibility. Um, but you're right. I think it, it, innovation is, is necessary here. We're, we're trying to, um, to push things forward and, and, and maybe try, try new ways. But we also have leaders that aren't specifically Black Lives Matter leaders, like Angela Davis, right? Ruth uh, Gilmore Wilson, lots of, uh, of different leaders that we can draw upon. Um, and, and so, yeah, maybe there are, maybe there are trade-offs. I, I, I want to go back for a moment. It's very interesting to me uh, how you brought in James Madison and, and, and kind of the Federalist Papers and thinking about um, checks and balances on tyranny and, and the need in kind of um, in this country from the beginning, you know, he, he writes about the auxiliary precautions of, of the separation of powers and so forth. That seems obviously to have been insufficient. <laughs> but, but, the, but the thing in Federalist 51 that strikes me is he says that these are just auxiliary precautions. Really what matters is that you have to depend on the people, right? Like ultimately that's what it's going to come down to. And, and, and I think that kind of prefigures the need for this democratic theory. What do the people have to do then, right? If these, if these checks and balances that are designed in the constitution aren't enough, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, that's entirely right. Yeah. So I think that's a really deep democratic spirit. That's, you know, part of that that argument in the Federalist Papers, but I think in a way by Madison doesn't get realized. And so in a way, what happens in the civil rights movement is saying, okay, you're right about this. We need these auxiliary precautions. We need these checks and balances, but what we have instated now isn't enough. And that's why we need the Voting Rights Act, um, for example. We need other ways to make sure that the democratic voice is heard. We need to be able to take to the streets um, and challenge the injunctions that are being against demonstrations that are being laid out and so on. So I think, so I think that's right. So I think the argument that I wanted to make was the Madisonian picture is right, but it's just incomplete in the form that it takes. And we relearn, I think, with every generation, like, you know, there's always going to be an imperfection that has to be challenged. So every generation, we're just going to go through this and figure out what isn't working yet and hopefully try to fix it. Yeah, it strikes me, you know, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical of the, uh, you know, the actual design of the Madisonian separation of powers. You know, it seems like in the United States, in the current moment, at least, it's made it like just impossible to do anything you know, like impossible to pass legislation. And, you know, I've often advocated for, you know, a much more centralized parliamentary democracy where, you know, the, the party that wins, you know, or the coalition that wins basically can do, you know, whatever they want subject to, you know, the civil liberties 
uh, constraints in the Constitution and so on. But it also strikes me that, you know, in countries that have like pretty robust social democratic systems, the checks, the, the check and balance is the, you know, uh, empowerment of the population. So for in Finland, for example, in Finland a while ago, uh, the conservative government was going to uh, cut the pay and benefits of like a relative handful of postal workers, I think, like only just a few hundred. And the union movement responded with like a general strike. Um, and it ended up toppling the government and they had to have new elections in which the social Democrats took, took power. Um, very young woman now is the, the prime minister. And so, you know, in a sense, it's, it shows you that, yeah, Madison did have a point in that, um, uh, you know, it is useful to have like, to, to not to, for the government to not, to be constrained somewhat in the w in the way that it can do things. But rather, I think rather than setting up these sort of elaborate, you know, political mechanisms, these formalisms, like actually empowering the citizenry to protest things that are horrible, um, is I think a much more effective way to do things, you know, and I think even in the United States, you could say back when, uh, the economy was much more equal um, in the post New Deal period. Uh, the government was a lot less tyrannical. I think that's fair to say. So, um, you know, do you do you suppose that uh, is that an intelligible analysis? Do you do you reckon? Yeah, I do think that's right. I think, well, also I'm Canadian and I should say I only moved back to Canada after being in Michigan for a few years in the fall. And right away, there was a really big like teacher strike in Ontario. And I thought, yeah, this is what my partner is a public school teacher. And I always thought that so much of what was going wrong for teachers in Michigan was essentially their inability to strike. Um, and here, a lot gets done. And, and teaching here is thought to be an important, valuable job with good resources for the most part. Uh, but it's because of the ability to strike. It's powerful. And so, you know, they were able to negotiate a, a solid contract this year as a result of that. Um, and I think without that ability to strike, the general strike, but also just more just speaking about democratic protests, I think without that, what do you do when you have an authoritarian government? There's no way to speak out. If you can't take to the streets. Um, that's why the right to protest, I think, is so important, as is the right to strike. How do you see this moment then and its importance for the opportunity we have? Of course, there are limitations because of you know, the pandemic and how that restricts Activism, even though the people have braved, you know, going outside and, and wearing masks and being very responsible despite being kettled by the police and jailed by the police and so forth. It, it seems to me really important, these, these moments of crisis, um, to expand kind of the, uh, to activate more of the population. Because if we can't just rely on, on the populations that are like actively oppressed all the time, um, we have to pull in people that are acting on behalf of others primarily. And, and, and to do that under capitalism is tough because people are exhausted. You know, capitalism does what it does to your, <laughs> to, to your subject formation. So, so what, what do you think about the need in these moments to really try to, to create citizens in the classical Republican sense to, to, to create people who, even when the pandemic's over, knock on wood, right? Uh, that people continue to be active and to, to fight for justice. Yeah, so I think we have to take a bit of a long view. So if we think about Occupy, BLM, women's movement, and then now the resurgence of BLM again, um, again, maybe taking this virtue theoretic view that we have to enculturate a habit of protest. Like initially, so I was in Ann Arbor when a lot of the BLM stuff around, you know, was happening just before Trump. And, you know, the protests in the beginning were small. But by the end, I think the biggest protest I went to in a city of 150,000 people was like eight to 10,000 people came. Um, that's massive. Wow. That was, you know, how many years later? But, you know, protest by protest, people came. They got used to it. You almost expect it. So every time something happened in the news, we almost expected there to be a vigil, a protest, a march. And people got used to it. The city got used Used to seeing it, more people got used to participating. Their fear also went away because they saw more more people participating in the movement. So part of it, I think, is habit. It is partly partly that. The other thing that you're saying though about capitalism and thinking about the moment of COVID, and also thinking about the Canadian context. Genuinely, after returning back to Canada, I would say we work less here. 
And so I think if we're always so busy working, we couldn't possibly get to the streets as often as we want to. Work is a way of distracting us. So I think with COVID, that distraction to some extent is removed, which leaves A, the room for self-reflection. Now you see all these white folks buying books about anti-racism and abolition. All the books are sold out. But, you know, we can be we can be cynical and say, oh, this is just like, you know, maybe this we could be cynical about that. I think what I see is it's a moment where people have time to self-reflect and they're trying. Um, and then they don't have the pressures of work. They have more time to actually get it on the street. So I think that that's some of the positive things I see in this moment. But the other thing I think that's come out for me so clearly is how much care is being built into the activism that's taking place during COVID. So at least the marches that I've been to are predominantly, again, it's not surprising to me that they're predominantly often organized by women of color who are often essential care workers anyways, but are handing out masks, hand sanitizer, making sure people are keeping physically distant by so many feet, bringing water and popsicles so people stay cool in the heat wave. Um, and I think that's why we haven't seen any community transfer of COVID because there's been a deep, not only intelligence, okay, and thinking about how to carry this out, but a kind of compassion that's enacted through the moment. And if we think about the movement as educating and enculturating civic virtues, what could be more important, not only than justice, but compassion? So I feel hopeful that like through going through this moat movement uh, and this shared trauma together, but then also reacting, like think about all, all the people that are out there removing statues or fighting against police brutality. Like some of the studies are saying that like 60% of those people are white folks, which is unlike the civil rights movement, right? That just wasn't the case. Right. So we right. see some people who are being habituated in protest culture. And I think that is going to have some, I hope, let's say this, I'm cautiously yes. optimistic that there may be some <laughs> long-term, uh, you know, added the yeah. self reflection reflection yeah. bit right but like you know that the right things are kind of happening and might create a better future that's beautiful i love that and i love how the hope can be coupled with the distrust for me thinking of <laughs> yeah. um, the political education i think what you're speaking to uh says there's more white people are being educated as much in witnessing and participating in the protests than they would from reading reading white fragility and we don't need to get into white fragility but like i think part <laughs> of the problem part of the problem with that that book is what we spoke out earlier it doesn't properly distrust like it says okay the white people are just going to learn on their own through these workshops to like overcome everything for us, right? Um, but on the other hand, when people witness the true nature of protest, and it's harder to villainize as much as Fox News tries, uh, I, I still have students who think like the autonomous zone in Seattle is a bunch of dangerous criminals. But like, I think over time, you just can't believe that anymore because you see that it's not that, that it's the mutual aid that you spoke right. of and so forth. So th th this is a kind of... It's almost like inculcating against the ability of ignorance and fear to to kind of, um, you know, have that buffer against truth and justice. Like over time, we're kind of tearing down the, those walls of ignorance because you just can't have that cognitive dissonance anymore. I think that's I mean, that's my that's my hope. I think in the most optimistic yeah, I moments, so. I think that's what's happening. And I think the other thing that's important, and this is a little response to the white fragility stuff, which I won't let like, you know, take us down the wrong path too much. But I think one thing for King is he talks about self transformation as being a basis for structure structural transformation. Um, he talks about that in the trumpet of consciousness, which is like the conscience. This is the last speech he gave before he was assassinated. Um, one of them anyways. And I think that's a really important key part. So we can talk about the cognitive mechanisms that lead to white ignorance. Um, I'm really interested in that phenomenon. But the point is then to kind of attack those so that it then leads to institutional change. Because without that, we don't get the long lasting change. And we know the biases, prejudices, they're all going to creep back up. So you need yeah. something to kind of protect against that, which is why King believes that there has to be institutional change as well. That's the part that I, I just feel like white fragility doesn't, for me, doesn't get at. It's the important, poli the political elements that are key to sort of societal transformation. Right. Yeah, it's, it's comparatively easy to, you know, promise to sort of like scourge yourself enough with the cat of nine tails so that you are not, you know, you no longer have any racist thoughts, but it's harder to think, well, I guess I'm just going to have to raise my taxes a lot to, uh, you know, fund Medicare for all or, or, you know, some kind of, uh, uh wealth transfer. Um, and you know, that, that's where I would say, you know, where the, where you find out how real the commitment really is. You know, it's it's easy to to say you changed your own mind, but uh, you know, until until you actually put that into some kind of concrete practice, um, it, it it you know it's at that point still theoretical. I think that's really important. I mean, 
Well, for two reasons. One, I just think that sacrifice, so we're talking about citizenship and education and virtues, one of the most important democratic virtues is the ability to make sacrifices. That's part of being a democracy. We have to give up some of the money we make and pay our taxes so that we can help people who are vulnerable. That's an important commitment that we should share as being part of a democratic society. Um, but that, that again, is something that's really difficult to do. But again, I hope could be enculturated. Like these are beginning steps by showing up on the streets. It's a way of kind of cultivating the virtue of self-sacrifice. Um, but importantly, I think, too, it's a basis for rebuilding trust in a society where there isn't the trust of fellow citizens. So we have a legacy of uh, enslaving people. We have capitalism, heteropatriarchy. There's a lot of distrust on a lot of different levels. But one way to start rebuilding is to sort of make sacrifices and show people that you're genuinely committed to the things that you say you're committed to. That's interesting that that balance, uh, you know, in, in your footnotes, you, you say you didn't get into how to balance um, trust versus distrust, but but we can talk about that now. And, and it occurs to me that that you're speaking to the horizontal trust, the political solidarity as against the vertical distrust. And when you think of something like uh, abolishing policing or abolishing the carceral state, that's kind of the political imagination that you need, the ability to think, okay, I don't trust the state to properly deal with these social problems. In fact, they seem to be causing a lot of the social harms. But that means at the same time, all the more I need to trust my fellow people, right, to deal with these things and to, and to help, you know, uh, be bystander justice and so forth and restorative justice. So those seem really inextricably linked in a certain kind of way. Yeah, I think that's right. So I have this follow-up piece, follow piece that's on sort of faithful distrust, and that's kind of the thing that I'm arguing, that um, that we can rebuild trust, and maybe then we can kind of collectively express our, our distrust of those institutions in the hopes of reforming and changing them. But it's important to have that, that trust between the people, because without the people and without the trust, you can't have like the solidarity that's needed to enact political change. So I think, that's, I think the way that you summarize it is a good way. I think that's a good way to talk about it. Yeah, we're we're in a exceptionally difficult place where like every institution is failing and yet the only way forward is to, you know, sort of double down on a kind of broad, you know, solidarity with all of our fellow citizens, maybe even including the loopy ones. Um, who still need to be vaccinated if and when we get <laughs> Well, that's R Ryan, that's the tricky thing because actually to your theory, uh, Mina, we should distrust that people will comply, right? With things because some people act like, Oh, it's fine for me to do all these social things because people will just do every single thing they're, they're right as if they're all epidemiologists, let alone the anti mask rallying people, right? Um, so in a sense that there is some horizontal distrust that is prudent right now. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so it's a it's a tricky thing, right? Yeah. So that's what I mean. There has to be a basis for that like gives you reasons to have trust. And I think making these kinds of sacrifices that we're talking about, which is putting your masks on, even though it makes us uncomfortable, uh, you know, like those kinds of that's a, that is a, let's, I mean, it's not a big sacrifice, but that is a sacrifice. And many people who work on the ethics of pandemics have long been talking about this idea that sacrifice in terms of self quarantine. Again, there are people who've been talking about this for so long about the ethics of self quarantine, yeah. but that was one of the key right. things that you need this, you need to basically educate people that this is a requirement when a pandemic happens, but also that it's your moral obligation to do so. Um, again, so that's part of that democratic virtue of sacrifice. Do you think that in Canada, for example, the, and that you spoke to this a little bit about how capitalism makes it hard for us to do the things that help us, you know, reflect and, and be good citizens. Uh, on the flip side, do you see that that political education and that ethos of sacrifice and that solidarity has been able to be inculcated more because of single payer healthcare, because there's more time off? It, it, how do you conceptualize and think about that relationship between the subject formation and, and citizenship versus those, those structural policy changes and differences? That's a good question. And admittedly, I've only been back in Canada for a year and I'm still rethinking like <laughs> okay. what the real difference yeah. really is and what is happening here. I do think yeah. there's just less of a workaholicism culture, at least in academia, like I just the different in my, my life in one year has really been astonishing to me. Um, just mm. like the, it's not that I don't work, I think I'm working, but I, I'm able to work in a way that feels less under the gun. So I have more conversations now than I, I don't think I, for example, would have been able to do this a year ago, have this conversation with the two of you, uh, I would have, I, 
would have felt like this wouldn't count towards tenure and that this isn't something I have time for. Right. Whereas now I know that, you know, it's all going to be fine. So I have time to have conversations yeah. and learn from other people. Um, so that's a good thing. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm like parsing. I think your question about the identity formation. I mean, I do think because we're a socialist kind of a social democracy, there is a more collectivist attitude. But we are also really bombarded by American culture. And so I think it's... You I'm can, sorry. You can see like since, since Trump, right, we know that here too, there's been more vocalization of explicit racism, anti-immigrant sentiment. There's the People's Party, which didn't exist before I left and is here now, um, which has an explicitly xenophobic platform. Their only platform was like, we're basically the conservatives. Our main difference is we're against immigrants. That was literally their webpage. It was like, see, see the conservative webpage for our platform. This is the one difference. We don't want immigration. Uh, the fact that that can even exist shows that we're not like immune to some of the things happening in the United States. So um, it's a, I think it's a very open question and I, I'm cautious about giving an answer because I'm still thinking through what, what, what the differences are and what, what's led to those differences. We can certainly say that English language media is a plague on this planet and it should probably be abolished at the earliest possible opportunity or at least break up the Murdoch empire. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, that gets to, I think, you know, like, like the, the, the problem we've been talking about with the United States is, you know, we, we are a single society and we are dependent on each other, but our great national mythos is that we aren't, is that we're all responsible for our own individual needs. And, you know, the, the, result of that is like foreclosing obvious win-win types of stuff for like, you know, 90 odd percent of the population like Medicare for all, um, you know, which because we pay so much in insurance premiums would, if you designed it even remotely competently end up with almost everybody with more money in their pockets. Um, and yet before you can really get behind that, you have to stop thinking about your, your, you know, particular, benefits and your, you know, insurance that you might've, you know, earned through your job, quote unquote, and just kind of jump in to the collective pool with everybody else, which is where we already are. To be clear, there is no society without interdependence, but you know, we, 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 we've got to, you know, inculcate that identity. And I will say, you know, having having listened to a lot of Martin Luther King's speeches and read a bunch of his stuff, I think that his, his work is some of the most powerful in articulating that fact that, you know, that we are helplessly in this together, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and it's interesting to me because he talks about the garments, shared garment of destiny. And I actually, people don't maybe know this about King, but when he was like a PhD student, he did a lot of Eastern philosophy. And actually, to me, a lot of that influence is Buddhist in nature, um, that idea of a shared garment of destiny, that we're intertwined and everything is sort of connected. Um, there's obviously sentiments within the Christian traditions as well, but that that explicit you know, kind of language almost seems to me to come from a Buddhist tradition. And I think he does have a beautiful way of um, kind of expressing the interdependence of people. And I do think in Canada that we do have a sense of that. And, you know, there was this, I'm sure both of you already know, but right when one of those UN reporters from the development program came to the U.S. and was looking at poverty and interviewing people, one of the things that came out that came in the report that there was in, in all these articles in The Guardian and the BBC was that, you know, he found that of all the different places he had traveled and people he had talked to, Americans were the most individualist and believed in a meritocracy so deeply that they couldn't really comprehend the idea of helping one another. But that person doesn't deserve it. They didn't work hard enough. They're not entitled. That kind of, that kind of sentiment. And then this, the reporter's sort of said that this he felt was at the heart of inequality in the United States, this individualist, meritocratic uh, ideology is really at the heart of, of so many of the inequalities in the United States. Um, and one of the other things I guess I've been thinking about and thinking about the historical differences is kind of back in answer to the earlier question that might explain some of the differences between Canada and the U.S., I think taxation is one of the biggest differences and the views and beliefs around taxation, right? So given that the United States sort of originated in this idea that taxation is coercion and didn't want to pay it to sort of the British Empire, we didn't really do that in Canada, right? We didn't have this like anti-taxation movement. We don't have a strong anti-tax sentiment in Canada. People here pay their taxes. They see it part of, as part of their collective duty to help one another and ensure mutual aid and social programs and so on. So it goes back to this idea of individualism, meritocracy, 
democracy, but also freedom, liberty, and the particular way that Americans have interpreted liberty and coercion is freedom from taxation. You just don't see that kind of notion of liberty yeah. at play in other countries. And I, I actually think that's really key. It's one of the key things to understanding the differences between Canada and the United States and its, its views about social programs and socialism. No, it's unfortunate. I, I think there's a way to read the history differently that, that's been lost uh, because it's it's taxation without representation. So re really, you could think that the problem was was not that the taxation was there, but that the people weren't heard and their interests weren't served, actually, which is like the key to what we're talking about. You need to pressure and fight and struggle, right, to, to make the representatives actually serve the interests of the people. Um, but, but part of the propaganda that lets that just not happen is this brainwashing that, that licenses liberty, that like wearing a mask is, is tyranny, that, you know, exactly. <laughs> right. Like giving me free healthcare is tyranny. It, it, it's just so quite a project of political education we have on our hands here when you, when, when, you know, white is black and up is down. It, it's, it's, it's quite a thing. So, so I think the hope that you speak of is very important because it does. I think a lot of us in this time during a pandemic are super depressed when we think, wait a minute, even now you don't see the problems with capitalism and the need for solidarity. Even now, like, you, you know, we see what Congress did with trillions of dollars in the states, right, to keep liquidity going for the banks. And they give us just one check. You know, uh, by the way, Canada, didn't you get a, a check every every month for what, 2000 Canadian dollars? Is that right? Yeah. So as if you've made um, $5,000 in the last, I guess, six months before COVID hit, you're eligible for a $2,000 check a month. And they've just extended it, you know, for another yeah. uh, seven or eight weeks. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think in terms of the hope, just like going back to the notion of hope, I mean, if it's true that 60% of the protesters in New York City and Washington, um, you know, were white folks, uh, people, and, and we, we got, we sort of talked about earlier about how the views of the, maybe, maybe the millennials are shifting leftwards. I mean, maybe we are starting to see that people are seeing in this moment that capitalism is screwing everybody. Um, and maybe they're, we're talking about a bunch of kids who are going to graduate from college. There aren't going to be any jobs. They don't have any health care, they're living with their parents, and there are no jobs. Uh, I think th that group of people is seeing that it's not working. And we are seeing, I think, to some extent, both on the left and even the right, some acknowledgement that incarceration isn't working, not just for racialized minorities, but white folks too, right? That's not the way you deal with drug addiction. Uh, that doesn't work for anybody. So I, I do kind of feel like there is a growing acknowledgement around some of these issues. The question is how far it will go. And one of the things that King is exceedingly careful about in every point of his writing is a backlash. Uh, he's often talking about the white backlash because he's talking about racial segregation, but we can think about the conservative uh, or the pro-capitalist backlash or, you know, or, and the white backlash as well, that we have to be ready for that. So there are these moments of progress, but we also need to stand careful and ready for the fact that there will be a backlash. It could come in the form of re-electing Trump. As a Canadian, frankly, it wouldn't surprise me. Americans are very surprised about Trump's election in the first place. Canadians were not. Um, so, you know, uh, it could be that, but we need to be ready for that. And then the point about keeping the movement and like the the momentum going even if things do get despairing we have to think about how to keep all of this going and i think that's really the project to think about and is it is it what what do we need to cultivate what would king tell us is it the proper amount of distrust maybe canadians distrusted our electoral system more than we sh we did and if we had a little more distrust we would have fought to 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 you know defeat trump originally what what, what is it do you think that the body politic needs to to guard against that backlash and guard against those powers I think it's interesting because I do think there's a kind of distrust that Americans need, generally speaking, which is a kind of self-distrust. There's a belief in American exceptionalism, American superiority, Americans, as we are seeing now. I mean, Trump has believed in the rise of the American empire this whole time, despite the fact that to everybody else, it's been obvious that it's crumbling. And so I think that there <laughs> needs to be a kind of self-distrust, which is that maybe, you know, kind of humility. We might just talk about this as a sense of humility, that we're not perfect. Right. We're a fail, as, as we were saying earlier, a failed state or a failing yeah. state. Um, and keeping yes. that in mind, that there isn't something that's going to save us. Again, that there's, or there's maybe not even our ourselves like we have to work really hard to put ourselves in a position to save ourselves and to keep working at that but that's a project that's continuous and ongoing right the two slogans were make america great again and america is already great <laughs> yeah right right oh geez yeah and and maybe you know it is an opportunity to recognize finally that there is no freedom without government, without collective, uh, you know, controls and operations, uh, without collective programs like social insurance. 
Um, and, and, you know, uh, just a baseline of administrative competence, you know, I mean, and that couldn't be more obvious today, you know, oh, what's, what's freedom? Well, in New Zealand, they're going to sporting events again. And, you know, I would bet that Canada will probably get there relatively soon. You know, people are going to bars. They don't really have any re uh, restrictions over there anymore. Um, in, in Taiwan, they did even better than that. They, they practically nipped it in the bud, had just a handful of cases, and here we are, stuck at home again, you know, s stuff's closing down, and this, the places that aren't closing down, people are dying. But, you know, like, <laughs> you can't be free if you're dead, or if you're permanently disabled from a severe case of COVID. And so I think, you know, it's like the universe is grounding a, a broken highball glass in our eye sockets. Just be like, no, you fools, you fools, you've, you've, you're completely mistaken about everything. And to, to enjoy that freedom, you know, we, we have to look out for each other. We have to care for each other and we have to make sacrifices so that others can benefit and so that we can benefit ourselves selfishly, you know, because there is no other option. Well, that's the point about the garment of shared destiny. In the case of COVID, it really is so clearly true, right? Um, our destinies are completely intertwined and not just within the United States, globally, right? Because we're in a globalized yeah. world now. So we have to think about the global public and the, the vulnerable amongst the global people as well. So there's no, cho I mean, yeah, I mean, I think obviously we need to cultivate that spirit of thinking globally, but also about the most vulnerable. Yeah. It's almost like there needs to be a global international socialist project to... <laughs> overthrow the evil capitalist forces that oppress everyone everywhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, this has been really wonderful. I mean, I don't know if you have other thoughts um, that we didn't get to or, or, or uh, we're super excited to read your book. We can't wait. Um, so please do let us know right when that's, that's available to read. But um, if you have any, any last thoughts or anything you want to leave us with, you know, feel free to do that as well. No, I think I don't. I think we covered everything. Uh, thanks for talking. It's been great hearing your thoughts as well on these issues. I mean, really important things to keep thinking through. Absolutely. Pre appreciate you. Thanks again. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for listening, everybody. See you next time. Hello, everyone. Alexi the Greek here. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Just a friendly reminder that uh, to support the show and also to get access to a number of bonus episodes, you could join us on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash left anchor, uh, $5 a month gets you a lot of episodes and really, really helps us out. So, um, if that's something you're interested in and, and you want to show your support, we greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much.